three masked men came in the cinema room. Um, they had balaclavas, one had a butcher's hook, uh, a sledgehammer and a carving knife. And I just thought, I'm gonna die. There's no way I can go through what I went through as a kid. But people always say to me, you know, who's your inspiration? You know, who, who do you look up to? And this sounds really egotistic, but me. No one helped me. I had to be my own fucking hero because I was mocked mercifully, I was torn down, I was ripped apart. Nobody wanted to help me. Uh, don't get me wrong, I did have helping hands, but it has to be you. You're, you have to want to change. So welcome Kerry Katona to the Turning Your Adversity Into an Asset podcast. I was just speaking uh, before this podcast and uh, done a bit of research uh, on you in uh, various <laughs> different pages and uh, interviews and Wikipedia sites. And uh, we got uh, we got a lot to cover, actually. And uh, let's well, I think it, it's, it's like nearly 30 years or something that I've been in this industry. So that's true. Well, 20, I think 25 years, you know, it's a lot, a lot of bloody uh, Google alerts, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. So the little intro I've got is entrepreneur, mother of five, TV star and survivor of adversity from crippling panic attacks, to feeling whole again, pardon the pun to anybody that knows Kerry from Atomic Kitten um, and all round survivor and, you know, someone who's been able to take life and, you know, bounce back, which is why, of course, we reached out and we're very, very grateful to have you on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so where to start, really? But the first thing that really grabbed me, which I didn't know about when I was doing a bit of research, and I always like to start here, um, the beginning, beginning, was that I saw that you were you were brought up in foster care. Yeah, only from the age of 13. Okay. So I had a really, really, um, let me explain what all victims are victims. Mm -hmm. You know, we all had their learnt behaviour and surrounding. Unfortunately, my mum had a terrible upbringing, really bad upbringing. Um, you know, she had manic depression. She was a self harm. And my first memory is watching my mum slit her wrist when I was three. And she, I was, a, I'm a product of an affair. So when I was born, the guy who I called dad, his dad was my granddad, but my mum left my dad for my granddad and married my granddad. So my granddad became my dad, and my dad became my brother. Hold on a bit, you got to slow down because I. What did you say? Can you say that again? So. I'm a product of an affair. Yeah, I got that one. When I was pregnant, she got with this guy who knew I wasn't his, who mm -hmm. I called dad for the first two years of my life. Right. Yeah. And his dad, I called granddad. But she oh. left the guy who I called dad for my granddad and married oh. him. So then who did you call your granddad then? Dad. So yes. I was only three when How she married. you three? I was three when she married. And I still call him dad to this day. He was 30 years old. And, and then that was, I don't really remember my mum living really with me and my dad, Arnie. I, I always call him dad. He got custody of me for a little bit. And then she was never with them anymore. And then she left him for a woman. And then she was in a, a relationship many, many, many years who then told me that he wasn't my real dad and that I was a product fair. And it was a guy called Ronnie Armstrong. And my mum begged me never to go find him because my mum's got blue eyes. We don't really look alike. I've got like really dark eyes, olive skin. And um, I never did. And I found him. And my mum had a really bad... So once my mum got cussed with me, we was in at refuges. I went to seven different junior schools and one high school. Uh, got diagnosed with sexy when I was nine. I mean, I knew the basics of reading and writing, but I was very uneducated. You know, I could, I knew the basics of a lot of words, but I was terrible in a restaurant. Um, I always got zero out of 10 on spelling tests. My mum was, she used to let her wrist up until I was 17. She was always ODing. And then when I was first, it was in a Salvation Army. And then when we got, then we got, well, I moved down south with my mum and Dave. And then we moved down south and my mum's fellow was actually inside with the crates and we got a Christmas card off one of the crates. Anyway, he stabbed me mum, told us he was Freddy Krueger, wanted to chop us up. Put Who stabbed your mum? My mum's fellow, Dave. I pulled the knife out. He wanted to cut her in the tits and fanny and chop us up and put us bizarre. Anyway, my mum went back to him. I ended up in foster home. I had four sets of foster parents. My last set of foster parents were truly amazing. I lost my foster mum a good couple of years ago, but I still see my foster dad. Um, yeah, so it was, a, and then I was brought up majority of my life with my nana Betty. Um, it's a very, very complicated mm -hmm. 
it's really hard to explain everything because it's really complicated. But it is in my first book. So I wrote, I wrote three autobiographies. So the first one was called Too Much Too Young, which is about all my childhood, also my mum having a really shitty child. Um, and then the second one was called Still Standing, which is about the bankruptcy and all the drugs. And then the third one was called Whole Again. So it's definitely been colourful, that's for sure, Lewis. <laughs> yeah, but you're saying it with a smile on your face, but I'm wondering how, you know, because obviously you've been through it, you've processed it, you can, you know, you need to talk about it now, which is amazing. But yeah. How did, how did that all affect you at the time when you was in your sort of... I didn't know team? any different. I didn't know any different. Me and my mum, we used to go on the rob together. You know, she gave me my first drug when I was 14. She told me it was sherbet, but it was me. So I didn't know any different. I just thought that was how life was. I, I And then I, I just ended up being... I got in a girl band. <laughs> Yeah, so, so that, how did you get into that transition? Where did you go from having this, like, so this one I had day? the most amazing breasts you can ever think of. I was a 34 double D chest with a size six waist, and I was like, I loved getting them out. I was like... And how old were you then? 16. So this wow. is an era of the page three with Samantha Fox and Joe Guest and Melinda Messenger. And so I, I was like, oh my God, I want to be a page three model. I wasn't going to be a rocket scientist. Mm. Back in the day, I was a pretty girl. You know, I was never up my own ass. I've never been up my own ass. I've always been a bit of a tomboy. I like Sandra out front crowd and being a bit different. And I, I loved getting my tits out. I, 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 I felt empowered by it. And I was actually going to be one of my questions, actually, because you've obviously been in lots of magazines. I always wondered sort of how that feels, you know, in that moment where you sort of have that on display for the first time. Well, my mum actually had one of my pastry photographs framed and put up in a living room when I'm like this. It was taken nice. back in a really good way at the sun um, with my breasts out. And it was a beautiful picture. For me, it's really arty. People make a really big thing of it, but no one makes a big thing of it when they go to the cinema and watch a sex scene or... Mm see you know Angelina Jolie walking around with a tit so mm. or Jennifer Aniston or Nicole Kidman not that I'm in their league but I feel I'm very judged because of who I am and because I'm from a council estate and because people know all the mistakes I've made they know and all this I get extremely for it and it's like it's no big deal oh, there's always a good judge aren't there but I'm sure there's lots of fans out there as well that are very happy to see those uh boobs. oh they love seeing those titties <laughs> <laughs> I was I had Gail Porter on there I know Gail and uh, she obviously had her whole body uh, on projected the onto the house of Parliament, Parliament right? Yeah. But she didn't know it was happening either. So that was a, that was a bit of a so yeah. At least she took the empowered route of deciding that this is what I want. That's that's awesome. I think it's, yeah. all, it's all good and uh, all power to you. Um, so, but this was at 16, you mentioned. So when did yeah, you... Yeah, so when I was 16, I wanted to be a page three model. And because I had a court order on me because of what happened to me when I was uh, younger, I I got put into a semi-independent home when I was 16. I got my what first... Sorry, semi-independent? A semi-independence home. So that is, um, it's like a, a care home, really. So I had my own toilet, my own kitchen, and a, it's like a bed sit, basically. Yeah, like a halfway house kind of thing. But... Yeah, I was living in a halfway house when I was 16, right. and I had to share a bath. Um, but I've always been very independent, you know. I've always, I think because of how my mum was, you know, my mum had issues with drink and draw. I kind of brought myself up more than anything as an only mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 17, I was in a nightclub and I was doing modelling. I worked, I've always worked from the age of 14. I worked at Warrington Market on a Saturday, then at night time I went glass collecting. Then I worked in JD Sports, I worked in a fish and chip shop, and then I was a BT sales advisor. Then after my independent, after the, the halfway house, I got my first council flat when I was seven in Warrington. And I was working at BT sales at the highest character store. I used to shit myself because you have to read from a script Mm -hmm. I couldn't read out in words because I was, I was quite unacademic. I mean, I just recently mentioned that I taught myself read and write. I knew the basic. I wasn't like completely. Mm -hmm. We well, said you're dyslexic as well. So that's obviously. Yeah, I am dyslexic. Like I'll get my words muggled up. I'll get things back to front. I got diagnosed that when I was nine. And then, um, so I'm in my council flat. I had no electricity. And then I started lap dancing. Yeah, that's, at what, 17? I was 18 when I did okay, that. But yeah. before I started lap dancing, I was in this nightclub and this guy approached me and I was a really pretty girl, but you know, and you know, I was dancing and doing all this kind of stuff. And this guy approached me and he said, Look, we've got, he had these leaflets. Look, we're, 
I'm in this band and we're looking for backing dancers and we think you'd be perfect. Band? He was like, yeah, it's called the Palm King. I thought, fucking pervert, Palm mm. King, my ass, piss off. I took the flyer home, I stayed at my mum's flat that day and I rang him up the next morning and I went down to her studios in Liverpool and two weeks later, I'm in Germany okay. as a backing dancer in this pink jumpsuit pretending to play the keyboard at this uh, like MTV thing in front of them. Amazing. Well, they say fake it till you make it, don't they? So that's a good example. Yeah, at this it was, um, and I always used to sing. I, I love singing. I've actually got a really good voice. I used because I was brought up in the pubs. I used to all the karaoke. I knew I was going to be a celebrity. I always knew that. And Davey T said to me, "Look, he said I know this guy. He's starting this girl band. He said you've got something about you. I think you should go and see him." And this guy was Andy McCluskey from Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. Never been for an audition in my life. Never done anything like that. But I always seem to be like center of attention I was always the main person to do something so I went with my Andy McCluskey and Stuart Kershaw and um took my page three photographs sat down told loads of jokes and we got on great sang a few songs and they actually based the band around my personality and I was a founder of that like life life change just like that and then I was a founder member of Atomic Kitten for months so during that time I had to pay the bills I got sacked from PT because I was shit at it and I started lap dancing and I was a fully new lap dancer I mean when I did my portfolio from a page for it you stuck it in because you only have to be 16 then and they wanted me to like be the new Samantha Fox but because of the whole foster home thing we couldn't do it I mean life just changed overnight but I really did graft to get there Mm. No, and I was a founder really member of Atomic Kitten. In well, the early 2000s, Atomic yeah, Kitten. Yeah. yeah, I was 17 when I when I met the guys. Mm-hmm. 18, I think I ended up being, I think it was nine, I think it was 1999, November the right now got in the chart top 10 amazing your life just changed but people the graft you have to do back then it's not like now you go on a tv show you become famous you get recorded mm. we really had to graft yeah, like we did all the sh- paper yeah we did all the shitty nightclubs all the school tours and i was just like this is gonna be amazing we're gonna be famous but it turned out to be a lot different than what i expected considering all the mm. skeletons that was in my closet you know tash had the most stability out of all of us. She had a wonderful mum and dad. Maria and George and a sister. And Liz had a great mum and dad. And there was me with all these skeletons in my closet. My mum being with woman, me getting me tips out, you know, being in foster home, the drugs. So when we actually did make it, it was amazing. And then it was just, and I was from a really rough area, really rough area. And I was that time, it was crazy. I hate it, hate the thing. So how long was it good for before it started to get bad? Um, I think for me, my favourite part was probably just the first single right now it's always gonna be my favorite song and how long was that over was it how long did that take four to singles we did one album i did the girls went on to be massive and really successful mm. but i got me number one um because I, yeah because I, I i i read that that he was kind yeah. of like replaced what happened what happened there i i i wanted to leave i I met Brian. So I was like, because we were traveling the world, we had nowhere really. So I, I stayed at my mum's council flat with her, which is a one bedroom council flat. And when I met Brian, it was just like, he when was you say mom. Brian, this is the guy that was in Westlife, right? Brian McFadden, yeah. Yeah. Just got to give some context to context. <laughs> people that were like, don't so know anyone. Yeah, he was in a massive boy band, which was like One Direction, like 30 number ones. I was in this girl Irish band. Irish version, right? Yeah, and so together, you know, it was crazy. And like a power couple. Yeah, and during Atomic Kitten, I don't know, like, we used to wear some TV and Seed UK and things like that, and I would be the one that they always picked to a main part. I, I, not my choice. I didn't ask him to pick. And then we did this photo shoot with the sun, and it was like in these leather cat suits like this, and it was supposed to be all three of us on page three. I think it was up at four o'clock in the morning to go do the Disney Channel show. I was like, oh, it's out in the papers. I said, I'll go in the uh, service station and get him. And we told manager came with me and picked the paper over opened it. I went, oh, for fuck's sake. My manager went, my tour manager went, just you, in it? I went, yeah. So I'm not getting back in the camp. I was well, that, Because we're a group, we're a band. We're supposed to do it together. So mm. there's always going to be egos. There's always... And bear in mind, we're like sisters. So we do have our fights. You know, you're on the road constantly together. Exhausted. It's really hard work. For fuck's sake. Oh, my God. I just didn't want this. And then when I met Brian and it came out. Because I got sacked from Atomic Kit when I was dating Brian. My record company, I was always in a headquarters getting shouted at because the girls was... Um, um, they had to have a legal guardian, but because I was 18, over 18, 
I could do what the hell I wanted. Mm. So no one was telling me what's where or how to be. So I was always getting shouted at. I was all trouble. Mm. And then when it came out about me and Brian, everything was about me and Brian, which wasn't fair on the girls. And I got that. I understood it. And I wasn't enjoying the fame. I fell pregnant. And that was my dream. I wanted to be a mum and a wife. And that was all I wanted to create that unity. I always knew I was going to be famous. Don't know why. And I think craving the fame is like craving love on it, which I've mm. had to dissect and process and I like my life and I think that's my childhood I wanted to wanted to always so when I felt pregnant with Molly, when you mentioned the fame there do you, do you think that was the pinnacle of your fame or do you think it was later on when you was doing more of the TV reality uh, work I think the pinnacle of the fame was obviously I did the jungle but I think the pinnacle of it all was all my downfall true people love people it people forgot love what I was, yeah, yeah people forgot I was in a girl band people forgot I used to be a TV presenter mm. you know that all went out the window. It was all about, you know, Kerry falling off that pedal stool and Kerry's done this and Kerry. When did that happen? When was that decline and, and what caused that to happen? I think that was when, after Brian left me, I moved back to England and I was just, I was really struggling. I just didn't know how to cope. And this is at the height of the news of the world. I had like 40 paps outside my house every day. And I was in the, I was on the news of the world every other weekend. It was, I got nicknamed the British Britney Spears. And it was, it was really, plus I was doing drugs well before I became famous. So when I came back home, just no one knew about it. Yeah. I don't really do it in the celebrity circus, circuit. Yeah. So when I came back over to England, you know, my mum wasn't the most stable person. She was a bit of a, a push and she was. And that was my stability. That was my coping mechanism to do coke and get off my head. Really. And what, what age was that to get context of the timeline? Uh, I'm going to say 2000. Uh, so I won the jungle in 2004, February. Brian left me six months later in the September. I moved back over to England in 2005. I had a problem. Where? where was you living? I lived in Ireland, in Dublin. I lived over okay. there for okay, well, five well, well. years. Yeah. yeah. So Brian left and moved over to Australia, left me and the girls for Delta Goodrum, the Australian singer. So he moved over to Australia and I'm left here in England, just thinking, how the hell am I going to cope? And me back over my mum was she was a bit a bad influence i had a proper yeah, nervous definitely breakdown definitely probably bad influence if she was giving you a sherbet and saying it was speed at the age of <laughs> a toddler i think yeah. we can establish that I was 14 um, and then I had a, a proper nervous breakdown. I ended up in the Priory and they couldn't treat me because my profile was so high. So they shipped me off to America, to Cottonwood in Arizona if I didn't want to come home. And I just felt pure shame. I thought, I can't believe I'm in rehab because I associated rehab with smack heads and low life. And this is where the stigma is so wrong because it, it's so much more than that. It's about codependency, depression, self-harm, love, your self-worth, gambling problems. And it was never like I had an addiction to cocaine. I was just relying on it to fill a void. I mean, walking away from cocaine was easy. Giving up cigarettes was a lot harder mm. than anything. It's it's just it's kind of yeah, it's just changing your circle. I know I did coke in six weeks. I came home and I was at my mom's and my mom went, oh, I've ordered one of them, which was devastated about. And that's when Mark Croft walked the door because he was... I've got something on my notes here uh, around that. Um, so this... Did this guy be end up becoming your husband? Mm, I thought I was going to get it for free, Louis. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Always marry the drug dealer. So go on, tell, yeah. tell us about that. Because so it's your mum's no. drug dealer. You meet him. It's a taxi driver as well, right? Yes, that's how he delivered all his drugs via taxi. Uh, but bear in mind, this is this is the environment I was brought up in. I didn't know any different. And um, I want to make it really, really clear as well. My kids never witnessed any. Um, they never saw anything. My kids were always amazingly taken care of. I was very open and honest with my children children when they grew up that they heard it from me they, they they didn't see anything I've never been on any a class drugs or drunk while being on tv a lot of the time it was um, the side effects of medication that I was on I was on a psychotic drug called um, clopromazine and zopacone and valnefex so if you google all that you'll see the side effects which mm. mean which I'm on none of that now was that was that because uh, another thing I've got around I've got all sorts of notes here um bipolar as well yeah so is that what so, you was on those medications? I then? got put on antidepressants when I was 19. I couldn't cope with the fame. I couldn't cope with it. It was it, it was because of where I came from and, where, and the environment I was brought up in. It was just, it was all very sly. It was just, it was awful. Like people saying, oh, you slept with my boyfriend. Oh, that's my sister. Oh, it's my cousin. I've never even fucking met any of you before. I don't even know who you all are. Yeah. Just 
it was just it was very it was very very bizarre I just didn't enjoy it at all and I guess cocaine became my coping mechanism to deal with that in in that kind of way and there was no really any true friends surrounding me um how, how long how long were you sorry to interrupt but I just want to how long were you taking cocaine oh god from the age of 14 to 2000 on and off till I'm going to say 2000 and the age to age I'm going to say from 14, I was doing drugs to 14, on and off till I was about 27. Okay, so that's quite a while. So that's like 13 years. So yeah, but it's not, it wasn't, a, I mean, it's really bad. I, because I, I remember I, when it came out in the paper. I, I don't actually I'm remember so that. I'm so lucky and blessed to be alive. I, I, I can't believe I'm here. Um, but it was never like I got up and got, oh, I need to have some coke or anything like that. It was, I was a binger. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah, oh, I was yeah. a ginger, do you know what I mean? Which, I was the same, you know. That I, doesn't justify anything, you know. It was, and the best thing I ever ever happened to me was my bankruptcy. Because that's another one on my list, you're ticking them off. I've got a little checkpoint here, so we can check some of these off. Talk this, go on then. So when you, I marry, Mar- marrying Mark Mar- Mar- Croft was, I mean, I got two amazing children out of it. But um, that should have been one night stand. I think I was so triggered and so traumatized when Brian left. Mm. Because I thought, oh my God, my kids are from a broken home. So when uh, Mark proposed, I was just like, this this will fix it. This this, this is, this you is know, the I, dealer, right? Yeah, I was just trying to recreate this family unit of being married. And it was, it was you know, I'm not going to deny, you know, I'm also, I love Mark at one point, whether it was real love. I, I don't know. It was all very, it was all very crazy. And I'm mad, but uh, I wouldn't change any of it. I How long was you with him for? 24 years. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I was with Brian time. for seven. I met Brian at a very young age. I was only 18 when I met Brian. I had Molly when I was 20. We was married at 21. Um, I was 25 when he left. Yeah. So it wasn't, people think, oh, because she's been married, this is a flash in a pan. That wasn't the case. I mean, I was with my third husband, George, for six years. Um, I was going to say, actually, something one of my, on my list. Actually, I shouldn't have smiled when I said that, because uh, this ended quite tragically, right? Yeah, yeah. So George, uh, oh God, I don't even know where we're up to. So Mark, yeah. It's okay. I went into bankruptcy. So Mark. Yeah, let's start there, yeah. Mark took complete advantage over my bipolar medication. I was banking with coots. I don't blame anybody because you can't. For a very long time, Lewis, it was everybody else's fault but mine. Um, You have to come at peace with it. You have to forgive yourself. You have to forgive everybody because initially you're allowing people to do this to you. What a lot of people don't know is my accountant stole my money. Um, he he went down for it. David BQ, Google him. You will see he got arrested. He did five years. He's actually on the run in um, Ireland at the minute. So he, that's why I went into bankruptcy. I was a Coots Bank. Mark Croft is... I'm signing all the I'm like, yes, signing all these blank checks. Mm-hmm. Medication I was on. No, mm-hmm. but when you're on coke, you're like, huh, 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 huh. you know what I mean? It was, mm-hmm. it was medication that made me very not with it at mm-hmm. all. It was very uh, slur speech, but I, I actually do have. It's so, almost am I, like, just. Is, I don't know if this, my memory is serving me. If this was even you, but I think it might have been. Was there a TV appearance of you where you were slurring on this morning? With yeah. Yourself? And everyone thought you were drunk or whatever. Is that when you was on this this med? This medication. I've got no reason to lie. I've shoved enough shit up my nose. I've drunk till cows come out. I've got no reason to lie. Mm. Um, I've never been a big fan of alcohol, but it went hand in hand with the coke. Um, But I have no reason to lie. It was a pure side effect. It's slur speech. Now, look at Jonathan Ross when he speaks. He's got a lisp. And I actually do have a lazy tongue. So a lot of the words I can't pronounce. And with my dyslexia. And it's just my accent. It's just I talk fast. It's the way I am. I've got ADHD. It's a combination of all sorts combinate of Combinate that with heavy medication the night before, which I took really, really late. And then I'm like one of the first guests on this morning. There's actually nothing wrong with me. It's a side effect to the medication. But back then in the day, I mean, that made me feel suicidal. When I drove home that day, I mean, it was like, it was like I murdered somebody. Mm. Is really that when was... everything kind of came out and it was like everyone knew that you was doing no drugs or something? No, no, not at that point. No one knew I was doing it. It was, a, I know it was like the most unkept secret that, you know, I did cope. But back then, like, majority of people was. It's just, I got... Yeah, I don't, I don't know why people make such a big deal out of it. Because I think... 
Sorry. Most, most you celebrities You've got the kids of every parent who went out the weekends back then and did a bit of coke. All the kids won't be with the parents. Yeah, I know. I mean, what what percentage of acceptable. celebrities in that world do you reckon? Not just coke? celebrities. I wasn't I wasn't hanging out with celebrities. I need to make this really clear. It wasn't in the celebrity, even though everyone was doing it. I never did it in the celebrity circles. It was a circle I was doing it with my mum right. and with Mark and all that circle I was with. That is who every, everyone was doing it. Um. But even the celebrities that point the finger and, you know, obviously... It wasn't to... the celebrities, it was a journalist as well. Right, I'm right. not going to mention his name because I wouldn't do that, but there's one journalist who I was massive into coke, yet he did this massive story on me, knocked on my mum's door with a bag of coke, a load of cash, knowing my mum had a drug problem, doing coke with her, and my mum sold a story on me. Oh, you know, the, the lens that they went to and the phone hacking and the, and the private investor, it was, I, I don't know, for some reason, there's always been this interest in me. I don't know what it is, I don't know why. Um, and at that time, people really, I, I, I'm, I, can't believe I got through a lot of it. I really, mm. can't. it was like a, a vicious circle. Mm. So they'd write a story. I'd turn to drugs because there was nobody there to support me. I had to be my own hero. I had to help myself because nobody else was going to help me. So I, um, I went into bankruptcy. I was, I was really there. And was that because of this guy, the accountant yeah. that stole from you? I'm Mark Croft. And I'll be honest, I could afford all, I could shove enough shit. I was a little. I could, I could do what I wanted. And I had this uh, tax account that was like for 86 grand or something, which was pennies to me. You know, please bear in mind, I came from nothing. You know, I got my clothes off a car boot sale. It was all secondhand. I, I shoplifted. It, it, it was really, really bad. I lived on ketchup butties when I was a child. You know, my mum would go missing for three days. I was like DJ's aid, my youngest, having to look after myself and go into cast my mum's gyro check and hide some of the money so I could go for a food shop. You know, I really came from fuck all, but I didn't know any different. And I just, with my money, I just, I wanted to bring everybody on this journey with me because what's the point in having all this if you can't share it? But it's who you're sharing it with. And I chose the wrong people and they took complete advantage of me. Mm. For a long time, I was in this self-pity party of, oh, the world owes me a favour. It's Mark's fault. It's Brian's fault. It's my mum's fault. It's my accountant's fault. You know, you've got to take responsibility. No one shoved coke up my nose. No one forced me to trust. I allow these people into my life and it comes to a time where you just have to deal with it and think what kind of person do you actually want to be what have you learned there wasn't mistakes Lewis there, there were lessons and I've had a lot of door slam I fell a lot I've tripped a lot and I've been knocked down a lot but you won't keep me down that's my decision I will continue to try and be a better version of myself and I'm sure I'll make many more mistakes I'm a mother of five this is where my drama comes. I, I personally have no more dramas. My drama comes from my children now as they grow up and they have their own issues. That's stuff I've got to deal with. And that is when you've got to say, what kind of person do you want to be? And for me, that's such a long, long time ago. But I'm more than happy to speak about it because I know there's so many people out there in the same situation. I'm looking forward to <laughs> hearing more about this turnaround. I think we've got a couple of things left on this list here to just quickly dip yeah, into. You crack on. Look, I told you I'm an open book. You crack on. Good. And I'm not doing this to try and, you know, rub salt in the wounds, but they're just very, they're very inspiring things to talk about once you've overcome them and still smiling, you know? Absolutely. So one of the things I've got in here, which is something which I didn't know of until I read it and I was shocked by it, is your daughter was held hostage at knife point and you was yeah. robbed. I was, I robbed. was, I was held hostage. Okay. So when... You still laugh at that. that was, it was fine. It was only me that was... <laughs> No, I had my daughter in my arm. She was only five week old. Oh so God. I had, we was living in Wimslow and we, I live in the Golden Triangle. So you know, he also come tag, you know, mm. for man and all that kind of shit. And um, three masked men came in the cinema room. Um, they had balaclavas. One had a butcher's hook, uh, a sledgehammer, a car. And I just thought, I'm going to die. There's no way I can go through what I went through as a kid. I have a mm. thing. And how old were you when this happened? 27. I was in that cross. And I still think he had something to do with it. Probably. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was. So I had another break breakdown because it, it triggered me. You have to remember oh, yeah. people have issues and memories. So when I ended up back in the primary flat, I was like, oh, it's drugs. I had nothing to do with drugs. I was completely triggered and traumatized from seeing this knife. Bear in mind, I pulled a knife out my mum's leg when I was 13. You know, the guy had a knife to my throat and told me he was Freddy Krueger and that he was going to cut my ankles off so I couldn't run anywhere and chop my hands off so I couldn't bring anybody and then cut our tits and fanny off and chop us up in the fridge. And then years later, I'm in my own home and these 
guys coming with a knife again. You think, and I was laughing. They locked me in the bathroom, and um, I'm thinking, I start laughing. I kept going, this can't be real. This mm. no one can go through this. <laughs> And then I'm crying and then I'm traumatized and I end up back in the priory because I needed therapy. I needed some kind of help. Yeah. But every time I was in the priory, I was so massively judged. Oh, it's drug. But that's how what I used to think of rehab. I used to think it was about drugs. I did as well. So much more than that. I'd get even now I'd go back. I'd go back to Arizona. I won't go back to the priory because it's shite. I'd go back to Arizona again. I'd love to take Ryan. I'd love to take the kids to a rehab because the lessons you are taught in there it's not just about drugs it's about fixing your your mind and your heart and your soul I mean I've massively got into I'm a very spiritual person I've massively got in I've just gone and got a, a shaman I, I want to go abroad and do ayahuasca and I've done the micro dosing with the mushrooms you know I, I've done the breath work you know um and that's that's rehab's not like that but the therapy is really good, but uh, yeah. you, I have, I've been mass. Everything was always my fault. It was yeah. my fault. I got robbed. You know, it was. Um, I think to come from a, a climb right up here after winning the jungle to being completely tarnished and you know mocked and torn apart, and <laughs> I'm very proud that I'm still here. It's just a big fuck you to everybody that you can knock me down, but you won't fucking keep me down. No. My decision, and I think I was just massively tired. I mean, I didn't help myself, Louis. I didn't help myself at all. I've got no one to blame but myself. But you've got to be easy on yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. You've got to, you know, it was a long time ago. And I, I've been clean now for what I was my 14 years. And when I say clean, it's I don't like. Know if you can hear the clap on Zoom, but chances <laughs> but it sometimes. But congratulations. I, I don't feel I deserve it. I don't, I, it makes me cringe because I think. We, we, we know how powerful addiction is, you know, and also what you just mentioned, the reasons for it, you know. Yeah, for me, <laughs> I feel I feel like fraud when people clap because I think it was my own fucking fault. I, it makes me cringe. It, it's like. But there's an element of taking responsibility, but there is also yes. an element of accepting the fact that yes. you know, some it, things it, have happened to you I was getting out of to, your control. Absolutely, because when you're 14 and your mum rubs speed on your gum and tells you it's sherbet, don't get me wrong, Lewis, I've had many a great night on drugs. I have, but I didn't know any different. I would save my pocket money up off my foster parents and go with a fiver and then go out for, because I I was only allowed to have supervised this. So imagine how things must have been bad for that to have happened. But I was I was an only child and my mum was my universe, as, as most children are. And I would sneak off to my mum. And it's so sad that my mum, she didn't know any different. You know, it, it is really, really sad. And my mum finds finds it very hard to accept her mistakes mm. where I've accepted my mistake you know and that I I struggle forgiving myself as a mother especially when I was with George because even though they didn't witness anything they heard the screams they saw the black eyes I'm just doing exactly what my mum did you know and I find it difficult to forgive myself because my kids are victims of me as their children will be victims of them as you're a victim of your parents so I've had to really go on a journey Lewis and dissect myself and analyze myself of why I am become the person I was or why did I do that and I'm working along shaman uh, Chris Hughes which has been amazing and I'm on this massive spiritual journey which I've been on for a very 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 long time but people always say to me you know who's your inspiration you know who who do you look up to and this sounds really egotistic but me no mm. one has I had to be my own fucking hero because I was mocked mercifully. I was torn down. I was ripped apart. Nobody wanted to help me. Uh, don't get me wrong. I did have helping hands, but it has to be you. You're, you have to want to change. Whereas with George, I couldn't help somebody who, who didn't want to be helped. I wanted to be helped. I wanted to be changed. So you have to do the hard work yourself. After George, after I kicked George out, um, I was age 36 until I realized all that. 36, I'm 43 next in september i know i don't look it thank fuck for fillers and botox but um it took me a long long time to learn to love myself and i gave my happiness to so many other people hoping that they would be the ones to make me happy but you have to, happiness comes from within whereas for me and ryan ryan enhances my house i don't rely on it if you don't love yourself no one else is really truly going to love you and i was on that journey when i met ryan and it, it, it's it's been an amazing journey completely different to everything i've ever been through like i remember going on this morning with george george um had a psychosis moment and was running up and down the street saying there was monsters chasing him and i went on this morning and, lie. and I said, oh, it was steroids and sleeping tablets to 
protect him and I knew full well he'd been taking care mm-hmm. you know so it was almost like because I had such a most wonderful marriage the first time I was trying to recreate that all the time and being so fake and false and because I thought that's what I want to see they want this happen me and him me and Ryan we argue like cat and dog sometimes you know he's my business partner whereas before in my relationship oh we don't argue we're so in this love is your I'm current partner it. right sorry Ryan's your current partner. Yeah, we've been together just over five years. And Ryan's very much in the background and we're complete opposites, right? I'm eight years older than Ryan and he has gone very grey over the years. (laughs) And if I had met Ryan 15 years ago, I I wouldn't have been interested. It it was... It would have been probably illegal at that point as well, wouldn't it? All right, I'm not that fucking old. (laughs) (laughs) I do actually think when I was out of high school. But we don't look... Ryan, come here, please. So I can show... Get on the pod. What a good match we are. Can you hear me? Please come here and stop laughing because it's... Let's have a look. Come here, Ryan, please. (laughs) There we go. Very handsome man. (laughs) Yes, we're business partners as well. Happily ever after. Well, I hope so. But... (laughs) I, I, and I, I'm an old romantic and I want that. Normally at this point, Lewis, I've popped about five uh, kids out. I'm talking to divorce lawyers, but we've been together over five years now. We've been engaged for three years. And I think... Talking to divorce divorce lawyers over who? What I'm saying is normally at this point... Oh, I see. Right, okay. I've popped a few kids I out know, and right, uh, right. I'm getting divorced. But that, like, we've, yeah, we're, we've not, we're not married. We're, we will do one day. But for me, it's so different this time. I was so eager to please, I guess, the public persona of, oh, I'm so happy, I'm so in love. Because it was such a massive fairy tale the first time mm. around. My first husband, we got a fucking blessing off the Pope. I mean, Brian McFadden got married. Yeah. A nice. blessing off the Pope. And it was ended in a divorce. That's a load of fucking good that did. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I got I got I got uh, picture frames off Mariah Carey, I Ronan Keaton in there, you know, Dane Bowers. It was like so I think I was always trying to match up to that. Mm. I think because Brian was so happy with Delta, it, it did hurt. But like when I, I knew George from, the best thing I ever did was I had an affair behind Matt Cross back, which is the best thing I ever did. Well, um, he deserved it by the sounds of it. So, yeah. So I went to boot camp. Look how much weight I lost. I went there high as a kite on cocaine and all this. Yeah, well, that would help you out, wouldn't it? To lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> and it was I was away from Mark two weeks and it was a bit, it was like coming out of a coma, the fog being lifted. Oh, this is what it's really like. And I didn't want to go back home and mm. I had a, and fell madly in love with him and he didn't do drugs or anything like that. And I thought, God, this, this is, this you is. You think that was also, you know, you know, earlier you mentioned when you go to rehab, you think it's about the drink and drugs and then you realise it's more about you and it's actually yeah. so much more. Do you think I'll that be honest we- with you, the rehab I always relapsed with. Boot camp for me, G.I. Jane and Sharon Smith, who's was one of my bestest friends who ran the camp. She's still, she's helped me out so many times when I've been skinned. She sent me money. She's, she is one, that, like when I say nobody helped me, the R certain P was there for me. True friends. When I left up north to go down south, that is when I met true people like Danielle Brown, who has been my best friend for the last 11 years, who was a backing dancer for the Spice Girl. She's Mel, Mel B's sister, my bestest friend in her world. Sharon Smith, a class, is one of my best friends. They all truly helped me. And going to boot camp, and exercise and the right food you eat is it was mind blowing. Mm. Changed my life. And I remember going home and I went, I've met somebody else. Here's your ring. I'm leaving. And it made me realize and look at look to your left and look to your right. And they're the people you're going to mm. like. But and you didn't you didn't stay with that person. I'm just wondering the question I was going to ask is I think I think that was meant to have that was just a stepping stone, I think. Mm. People did get hurt in the process. And I'm truly sorry for that, but I, I don't regret it because I think that gave me the push to leave Mark. Bear in mind, Mark was on the front of all the papers with his hands down girls' knickers and always cheating on me. And I was talking back because I was so insecure. I was so desperate to be loved. I thought, you know, I knew Mark was punching. I gave him the world. I thought, well, he'll never leave me like Brian left me. So mm. people don't, because you're a celebrity in the newspaper, people don't. I'm a human being with feelings who are going through my own triggers, my own traumas, who are doing these shit things because of how I'm processing things. So I kept taking Mark Croft back all the time. Mm. And I think, you know, having that affair, and I'm the most loyal person you'll ever meet, and that is not my character, was... A push. I think it was almost like a sabotage, like a deliberate sabotage. It wasn't a sabotage. It gave me the push to be a better person because I left Mark Croft. 
like Kev was amazing. He was so inspiring. He really was. And I was I was in awe of him. I thought, God, the way I was going back home to a drug dealer and Kev was fit and healthy and talk about food and being a better. And that gave me that was like a whole new world for me. And this was all down south. And I didn't want to go back up north, this circle. It's like being in a tribe. And every time you try and bet yourself, this tribe pull you back down because I think it's realization for them that they're going nowhere. And you're you're the you're the little piggy bank as well who's supplying everybody with everybody got the money. But they don't want you to get out of that realm that you're in to see a better life of. So they bring you back mm. down to their level. So it's um, interesting you said that. Are you are you close or no or friends with Katie Bryce at all? Yeah, I spoke to Katie. Not 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 like we're dead close. We both support each other. You know, we've always got each other's back. Uh I don't know what's going on with Kate, only what I read. Um, it's not my business, you know, if Kate knows me here. I remember when George beat me up once, I ran Kate and I was crying and she was like, get in the car, I'll come and stay here. And then you don't want to impose and you don't want to be a burden. So yeah, mm. Kate, Kate That's good. <laughs> Me and Kate have had our ups and downs in the past, you know, as people do. But, you know, I think me and Kate relate to each other a hell of a lot. Well, I was going to say that because she she was on the podcast as well. And she said she said some very similar things to you. Yeah. So me and Kate, we relate to each other. We've got the five kids, the three marriages. It's really weird. We both you said that it. she was used as well by a lot of her circle that yeah. just wanted her money. Both, and... What's really weird is we both did pastry modelling. Uh, we both went bankruptcy. We both got five children, so three different men. We've both, both, got a... both written books. Both on OnlyFans. We've both got a mixed race child. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it is. We we've been through so much. Who's got the best tits though? Oh man, Kate, your tits are ridiculous at the minute. They're just, <laughs> but there is like mine are real. The, these babies are mine. <laughs> um, but okay. yeah, I give you the but, advantage, yeah, you I guess. Know, and that's one of the first things that I'll never forget from meeting Kate. We was in, I was in Tom McKinnell's with Tash, Brian, and she was like, that's fine, no, go on, feel me tits. So I'm going, Brian, feel him. I said, I feel something that's fucking real. <laughs> so I've always been a very strong woman, and I think that's what Kate respects. And yeah, we, we, we've we got each other's back, you know. People always just look on the surface of what's fucking up and going wrong, and no one understands what's going on in someone's core and soul and mind and heart, mm. and why they're making their own decisions. So they're all very quick to judge. So I'm not one to judge Kate. You know, I've been there, we've done the bankruptcy we've done the drugs we've done the marriages the divorces we've had the fairy tale weddings to pop stars it's very very crazy how similar our lives have, have been we we're both pregnant mm. Heidi and princess there so in touch I took princess on the holiday um yeah I spoke to Pete the other week for the first time in ages Molly was at a concert in Dublin and Brian was there doing boys life with Keith and um, Pete was there because my kids Pete was like an uncle you know I was mm-hmm. Kate's bridesmaid when she got married yeah it's it's crazy how maybe you should reach out to her. I think you guys because was Kate the other week oh okay yeah, it's not like we're not friends. We 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 got each other's back. We've known each other. I've been in touch with Katie out of all celebrities the longest. It's not like we're the best of friends. We go for it. I live up north, she lives up down down south. But when I was down south, I did see quite a bit of her. Um, she came and stayed with me for my birthday. You know, um, we've all got problems, we've all got issues. But I think the media, for me, I look, I mean, let, let, let's put it this way, Lewis. Say I was in the dentist and I picked up a magazine and me and Kate are on the front, right? Which we always have been. Me, Kate and Pete were the face of OK Magazine back in the day. We, we're still selling magazines. So say I went to the dentist, I picked up a magazine, right? I open it up, I read new, mag- close magazine, because I work for new. Close magazine, I open it up. Even some of the stories in there, I open it up, I read something about Kate, they, oh, this massive downfall, and I'm going, oh, I'm so sucked into going, oh, my God, I can't believe she's done this. Oh, yeah. oh my God, I, I, I'm sucked into this this story that is in black and white. I then turn the page, and there's... Yeah, lies about you. And I read it, and go, well, that's sort of fucking bullshit. <laughs> So I understand the perspective of Joe Boggs buying a magazine, reading something and being completely taken out of their own reality to read so much shit about somebody else. Because no matter what you say, sometimes it just elate you and takes you away from your own issues and your own problems. So I'm never one to judge. I'm very wise, Lewis. I'm very wise. I want- listen to the podcast we did because she talks about how it's all rubbish and she's actually doing really well. She's turned her corner. She she came out the priory and she's uh, she admitted all to the, you know, some, some difficult times, but she's in a good place at the moment. That, that- like I say, I spoke to Kate the other day. Uh, and, you know, Kate is, Kate's Kate. You know, everyone's very quick to George. And let me tell you something, the way she's been with Harvey is fucking phenomenal. You know, that woman's been through hell and back. And, and you know what it is? It's because we're women and because we're mothers, we judge. If I was a man doing this, no fucker would say anything. Boris Johnson has his seven kids to his six fucking wife. How much? Ma- and the world was, yeah, well done, Boris. 
me some of another fucking kid. Well, I'll give and you that- another one. I gave you one, but I'll give you another one. And actually, let's talk, about, let's talk about let's talk about the turnaround. So, are you trying turn to give me the clap, Lewis? <laughs> you probably already, you probably already got it. I think <laughs> well, that's done for. Go on, quick, move on. No. Um, so you obviously there's there's got to be a turnaround point. You just mentioned that you provide them for your children. You know, I always have. Now. I always have. I I've, I've always been a grafter. I'll all oh. I this everything I do, Lewis, is for my kid. Money gives you options. Doesn't make you happy. I know that, but it gives you options so I can create these amazing adventures and these amazing memories with my children, and you know, give them everything that I never had. This is for them. This is why I do it. My kids are always going to get shit because I'm Kerry Katona, because I'm their mum. So I'll go and do OnlyFans. Why not? Doesn't matter what I do. They're going to get shit because it doesn't, I could become a lawyer. They'll still get shit. So I'm going to make my. We're going to talk about that, actually. It's one of my things. But I was going to talk about a few things first. But while we're on the subject, how long have you been doing that? OnlyFans. Because I've got uh, some information here. This is your OnlyFans millionaire. Is that yeah. true? Yeah? yeah. Well, you're yeah. doing well then. Apparently on uh, K- Katie Price denies course, but it was on her Wikipedia page that she launched her OnlyFans and only got 150 subscribers, but she said it's not true. She's made lots I of- convinced Katie to do OnlyFans. Yeah? Okay, cool. Convinced- you're, her, you're her mentor, are you? I, I, were, I remember me and Ryan going around Kate's and going, look, you need to do OnlyFans, Kate. I can ask it. She'll tell you. I was like, Kate, get on OnlyFans. I so don't how long, know. How long have you been on it? Three years. Okay. And, and what three sort of stuff years. do you do on there? I did it three years, Ryan. Three years. And what sort of stuff do you do on there? Well, you have to subscribe, but I'm not giving you <laughs> fucking mates rates. But like, what sort of <laughs> level are we talking? Because Kate says stuff like, you know, it's still clothed, etc. Oh, you know? I get me tits out. I yeah. don't give a shit. You know, I, I'll go on a beach and build a sandcastle with the kids topless and the pups get pitched. So for me, like, sat like this and then just going like and posing it's hard it's you know it's a bit of... and it's not like something you've not done before is it but now you're getting a oh, nice yeah, subscription I mean, and a couple of mil for I'm it so a few new charts that no one wants to see me fucking kebab after five kids my poor ryan's got put up with that do you know what i mean but it's I, I, it's like i'm what i used to do nuts and fhm and zoo magazine they don't exist anymore you know so for me it's like i'm having the last last lewis i've got yeah. two lamborghinis i live in a mansion not that that any of that matters. Let me make that really fucking clear. Take all this away. The only thing I'll take with me when I die is my memories. Mm. Not be like it's fucking Gucci bag. I don't give a shit about any of that. I've only got this because I, I, I can. But for me, it's about who am I as a person. Just because I do OnlyFans and get me tits out does not mean I'm not. Okay, me, I thought if, if there was a market for OnlyFans for men, well, there probably is actually. There is. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, there probably is. I do feet pics. I do it all. <laughs> That there would have just got you a couple of thousand extra subscribers, I think. Uh, people think, how she doing that? I'm quite flexible. <laughs> Aha! <laughs> that's, another, that's another drop, is it? For yeah, you? but for me, it's it's like, so if I can take a picture of my feet and make a certain amount of money just by taking a snap, I'd be stupid not to. I don't want to be sat behind a fucking I'm, desk. I want to get my feet. Do you reckon people yes, pay for these? I've seen your feet. We, that's what we showed each of our feet, didn't we? This, up. Yeah. <laughs> how much would you pay for that? Guys, let us know in the comments <laughs> how much... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do a foot collab at some point. Say that again. Maybe we can do a foot collaboration at some point. Absolutely. I'm surprised they're not doing a club with Kate, you know, on there. But yeah, I mean, the thing with me is I don't airbrush. I don't airbrush anything. I know, I know my um your niche. Your niche. I know who my fans are, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm a MILF. Yeah. Why is living his fucking fantasy? <laughs> you know, I know it's a category and I don't airbrush anything if I've got cellulite, if it's like rolls, it, it, it is what it's what you know, it's um it's great and I sat my kids down, I told my children, and there was only Lily, really, who was like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure about this, but when the money started coming in, they all got the fucking iPads. Mum, go all the way. Just do it. We're getting yeah, shit in the money, Just yeah. do all the way. I mean, it's not like they can't Google it and find those pictures anyway, surely. They're already out there. I yeah. mean, our Heidi, she she got a bit of shit at first. Like, the young lads in school, oh, your mum's on OnlyFans and all this. I went, well, Heidi, turn around and tell them to sell the sad, the dad, stop fucking subscribing and tell your mum to fucking satisfy your dad. Tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she did. And when you get picked up in a Lambo, it doesn't really matter, does it? Exactly, exactly. But, um, it, I mean, like I say, it doesn't matter. Oh, I mean, Mac has got your mum's a co care, your mum's a. She might, it doesn't matter what I do. They're always going to get shit because their mum is Caricatona. And that breaks my fucking heart because mm. all of my mistakes have, you know, hurt my children. But, but you so said, it's in but their you said, and they don't one, deserve one. I was going to say, one hat, you know, there might be some people that, oh, your mum's Caricatona. But there's surely some people that are also like, oh my fucking God, your mom's scaring a toner. Absolutely. Well, right? Absolutely. They, you know, my kids love the benefits of all of it. And they all think they're like, I mean, 
I, oh, I think a few of them are coming in this industry. Our Molly's uh, doing a, 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 an upgrade in Ireland. She's away in Amsterdam at the minute. Lily, Lily did coach trip with me, which we won. Uh, then she pantomime with me. Heidi is going to be on TV. Absolutely. She's just a star in herself. Max will work in construction. Max is uh, my son. He's, he's got ADHD. I've just pulled him out of school. And uh, DJ comes on tour with me and wants to be a, a dancer in Panto. So she's joining me this year at Christmas. A question for you, and I bet you probably have had this a few times. And curious to know if any of your daughters wanted to do OnlyFans or anything like that, what would you? What could I do, Lewis? What could I say? Seriously. But what, but, but what would your opinion be? Would you would you encourage it? Would you no. say absolutely no. not? You know, absolutely, I wouldn't encourage it. But all I can do is guide them. But, what, you know? but when you're so proud and happy and excited and energetic about it, and you're like, what? Well, it's happy? different but, when you're a mother. Right. And it is, and you want the best for your kids. Obviously, I don't want my girls getting the tits out. And but if that is something they want to do, all I got, they want to be a lollipop lady, a lawyer, OnlyFans, a stripper. I, I, all I can do is be there for them. That's and all about, I can what do. About, what about the conversation around drugs? Have you set them down? Yes. So when Molly was eight, no, Molly was nine, Lily was eight, they had no idea. Well, not necessarily your drugs, but more them sort of, you obviously don't want them to fall down. Absolutely. But also as well, I don't, all I know is I hope I've scared the shit out of my four. (laughs) I know you've meant that in a nice way. So I, I, did, I did a TV show called, um, what was it called? It was something about Kerry Katona, The Truth About Kerry Katona. It was a, a show, a documentary. I'd, and there was a lot of crying in there. There was a News of the World cocaine video. And I sat Molly and Lily down. Wow. Video of you I, doing cocaine? Yeah, while I was doing my, my reality show. How did they get that? You literally did it. Matt Cross set me up. Oh, fucking, he sounds like a right master, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um... I hadn't touched coke in ages and the kids were in the garden playing and Mark had just cheated on me and this guy said, I've got some information. I said, give it me. He said, I won't give it you. I said, put a line in your bathroom. I said, oh, what the fucking line? Just give me what you know. Anyway, because I was like, so what? It doesn't matter. There's no excuses. I did what I did. It, it is what it is. I can't take it back. It's there for everybody to see. Uh, but my kids didn't know about it. And I sat the children down and I did this documentary about my life. Um, and Was that when it came out in the papers and stuff like that? Or was this after that? It came out. It went when it came out that you was doing drugs it's, and people, it was like the first sort of time. Why would the kids be reading fucking news at World at eight and nine years of age? And not I the was, kids, but I remember there was a time where it was kind of like big news, Kerry Katana yeah. and cocaine, and you had been doing it way before. Is this kind of when it came out or is this? Like it was a bit, it was, it was after, it was after that. Um, what was the show called? I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, I showed, I sat the girls down. I was filming my own reality show at the time. And I sat both down and said, look, I'm going, and there was at this private school down south. And I said, this show's coming out. Um, I want you to watch it. And there's a lot of stuff. Cause you, I'm a, you become a great actor. So you, you're very good at hiding things when you're like that back in the day. And I was very protective of my children. And just because I was doing drugs at a weekend doesn't mean I was a bad mom. I shouldn't have been doing it. Doesn't mean I wasn't there for my children doesn't mean they wasn't going to school and they didn't have the fucking world and universe at the feet do you know what I mean doesn't mean it's acceptable um anyway they watched this tv show I said there's gonna be a lot of things in there that you didn't know about your mom there's a lot of crying there's drugs in there and they both watched it and I sat back like this I had these big fat tears coming down my face because I was so ashamed that I had to show this to the children but I was also being filmed for my own reality show and at the end of it I went ask me anything you want and they both went did all this happen why did we not know about it I said, because I didn't want you to, but we could have helped you. And I went, but that's not your job. It's my job to look after you. But this, this is, that was a, that was a while ago. This, this isn't going on now, but I need you to watch it because I I wanted you to see it first before kids started saying to you. Mm. And they were like, so it was like you were living a double life because they didn't, they did not have a clue. And it was like we could have helped and I was like no it's not your job my job's look after you and I did look after them I was mm. always there for, I mean I am the only constant in my children's life you know I am you know Molly and Lily got their Irish lot Max Heidi and DJ they only have me and right you know I am the only person they have and I will do and I will die for my kids I was like a bullet but yeah I show my kids I've been dead open and honest with them like if DJ was sat here now I would talk about it so she can hear it I've got it's all there to google so mm-hmm. why am I going to hide all this, you know? Well, I was more thinking about, like, the conversation you would have around them not 
falling down the same path but obviously it's difficult to do and if they you know it, it is it, it, it's like i'm not I, just because i listen if i start you say my kids are doing drugs or they were struggling anything it goes in that eye and out the other because i'm their mom despite the experience and knowledge i have let them talk to a stranger and they'll listen mm. so every parent will tell you that so it doesn't matter if i'm an expert in um depression okay. or i'm not gonna listen to because i'm their mom what does I remember our Heidi did the voice right, and uh, she got through. She got three turns. It was amazing. I took us. Then she was in the the battle of the band bit, and she had to go do this dance routine. And so I went, Heidi, let me give you some advice. Listen. And she went to me, What do you know about any of this? I was like, Heidi, I was in a girl band. Yeah, well, it's not like it was Little Mick. Do you know? What I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Oh my god. So the only thing any parent, or any mother can do, any dad, is just. Be there for them. That's all I can do. And they're going to have to make their own mistakes as much as you want to protect them. And and you tell them right from wrong, because I know everything you do as a parent. You know it all. You don't want them to make. All I can do at the end of the day is be there for them. No matter what happens, I'm the mum. I'm always going to be the mum. I'm always going to love them. Obviously, I don't want to make any mistake, but how else are they going to learn? Mm. I don't, not just like, I don't talk about drugs, but overall, you know, they, all I can do is guide them, advise them. But I'm never going to be able to stop them. I fucking hope to God it, <laughs> that never happens. Yeah. I, I think I've scared the shit out of them. But drugs aside, I think anything in life, any hurdle they come to, you know, the older they get, the more they listen to me. Like, mm. you know, Molly's on the phone to me every day and, and Lily, the older they get. And like, and then as a parent, you'll have your arguments. Like, I have a massive argument with our Lily. She's 20, you know. So it that is where my drama comes from now is trying just, be the best mom and teach them lessons. It can be. You know, he's teach them these hard lessons because my kids were born in this place. They don't know any different. I wasn't. I grafted my ass off. Um, so it's also trying to teach them. Like, I remember Molly and Lily, they got really snotty. They, go, they all go to this private, they got really snotty. I went, who the fuck are you two talking to? Get in the car. Mm. My children talk very well. They're very southern because they've all lived down south for 14 years. They've all got something and they all talk very proper. And I took them to a refuge. And I was like, look, this can all go like that, you know? So um, I have tried to teach them a lot of lessons. I'm very down to earth. I'm, I won't use the word normal. I lose it very easily. But um, again, it's as a parent, all you can do is advise them, guide them, and then let them fly. And whatever they decide to do, as long as they're passionate about it, it's their dream, so they're not against the law. Even if they're difficult, you just got to be there. That's all you can do is be there. They're little fucking shits. <laughs> 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 Amazing, love it. So you, so you mentioned you're doing. So, so what are you up to now? So you mentioned you're doing the only fan. I know that you've also just to help you. Um, and I'll big you up on a few things. You've you've sold nearly a million copies of your books, right? That's yeah, pretty so impressive. I've wrote six books because of OnlyFans. I've been able to invest in myself. Okay. So I I started my own clothing company called Kerry's Boutique. Nice. Um, Ryan went into business together, and we started a fitness website called MFit. We oh. also started a dating app called Marnie because we met on oh. we met on a dating app. Oh, um, Marnie, so- what's the What's the it's a dating app? It's like Bumble and all that. It's you know, but for me, it was like the one thing that because I've been married three times, I've only been divorced twice because I'm actually widowed because George passed away and he refused to marry me. He refused to divorce me. So a lot of the things in the papers like divorce three times. Me and George wasn't divorced. I was like, legally I'm a widow. Um. But people think, and I was six, six months split up with George. So people then think, oh, I started to think, oh, I'm not allowed to get another relationship now because they've all failed. Why? So at mm. 36, I'm like, I have to be alone for the rest of my life. My children growing up and flying the nest. Everyone deserves a happy ever after. We're all entitled to it. Just because this quite to say, young thinking about it as well, actually. Yeah. Well, people are like, oh, here we go again. She said that about the last one. She said that. About- and I did. Mm. I don't know what's going to happen with Ryan. Love you, babe. I hope we're together for the rest of our lives. Do you want, do you want him to propose? I am engaged. Oh, you're engaged. Okay. Yeah, I've been engaged for three years. He's just right. not up the aisle. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm not pretending to be something I, I'm not. I forgot what I was talking about now. Oh, yeah. Talking about so what you're up to now. Six and... years of age, six years of age, does that mean I have to be on my own for the rest of my life? No, I wonder if there's a happy hour. Around, but I was so concerned about what the public were going to say and what the press are going to say that I'm like, oh, my God, that I hid my relationship for almost a year with Ryan. In fact, I did Slabs Go Dating and I was with Ryan. <laughs> Get their time, why not? Yeah, so now, um, you know... 
I'm an entrepreneur. I'm always grafting. I'm always working. I have to like a bit of time out from traveling and working away because I live out of a suitcase. Um, I've just been diagnosed with scoliosis with a bad back. That's why I keep that. Like, you see me keep moving. It's just because of my back. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's just because I've been sat for a long time. It's just because of my back. Um. So yeah, we've got we've got several companies. Just opened a new company called Dedicated, which we sell. Um. You know, high end Rolexes and you know travel and security. I know I haven't got mine on today. Day. Where's mine? You're not representing. I know. Oh, I, took, I had a shower, so I took it off. Um, yeah. So all oh. you know, I'm always working. I'm always grafting. I'm always thinking what I can do next. Um, and Ryan's an amazing, amazing business partner. So, but that that's a struggle when you work with somebody who yeah, you live with, yeah, especially yeah. when I'm working away from home. I want to come home to my sanctuary, and then I come home and I'm coming home I'm to, to work. So it's yeah. hard for us to also take our. Hats off to be a, a loving partner, to be a fiance, to be a business partner and a, a parent. And mm. so as everybody, we struggle, you know, because that's that's life, you know. Then you watch the telly and, and people pretend to be something they're not and it's perfect life. And it's not fucking real. It's no. weird. And actually, I've got a, a last one of the last questions for you because you've actually ticked up everything on my list. Congratulations. We've got through it all. But one of the questions I have for you is how, because you share your story so openly now and it's great to hear because it's so inspiring and raw and authentic and you've turned it around and it's brilliant. And I think a load of people listening to this are going to love it. How how long have you been sharing that? Part? Because there must have been a point where you kind of- Well, it was sharing without, it, it got started sharing without my permission when I became I famous. Right. So, so it was- kind of got, When was the point where you was like, do you know what? I'm just going to- That's what you have to do. You have to- hold your hands up and take responsibility if you act mm. have to and that's what i did and now no fuck has got anything so when on was them. that how long ago because it takes probably quite a while to get to the point where you're it, it was i think it was when i split up with mark croft after the cocaine video so he kind of did you a lot of favors in a way because he probably broke you down so far that you kind of well, have to... you know i can't but i mean i od'd on coke mm. and I, w- I was fitting and i remember mark being over me it was the most sounds so funny when I, it's not funny but it was the most beautiful feeling to come back to my body because I was surrounded by angels who saved me and said you've got more to do it was it sounds cuckoo and crazy but I know I what happened to I lived in Bali for three years and sometimes in the middle of the jungle doing all sorts of I mean I've been so 30 minutes this morning and I, I'm just in such a I mean I'm still learning to be at peace with myself and to forgive myself and it's step by step but I am in the most beautiful mindset of who I am and I was so eager for everybody to love me I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea so don't be a fucking mug don't know what it means I made it up and I like it (laughs) and I'm not going to be everyone's cup of tea and I'm okay with that that's fine because the only people who I want to make a brew for anyway is my children and Ryan that's all that fucking matters to me at the end of the day is we don't have a social life I don't go out drinking I'm in bed by eight o'clock but don't ruin my reputation because people think I'm this wild child I we work so hard that we like we, we was in bed the other night, me and Ryan. And every night the kids come in because I go to bed dead early, me. I don't want to be sat downstairs by myself. So we was in bed the other night. It happens every night, and the three kids come in, <laughs> and because obviously the oldest two girls have left home now. And um, Heidi comes in, and she's like it's with her hair. Max is toy fighting with Ryan, and DJ's doing cartwheels in bedroom, and they're telling me all the stories and all gossip from school. And I'm just sat there thinking, this is everything I ever craved. And, ever. and I got up and said to Ryan, I said, oh bless. How blessed are we? Mm. This is all that matters at the end of the day. It, it fills me with joy. It really does. It, this is all I'm ever going to be able to take with me. And that's all that matters. And I'm just sat there going, as a child, that's all I ever craved was that unit, that fulfillment. And I have it. And I think we all get lost because we're all so fucking busy. We're all working, doing all this. That everyone forgets to step back and go, what well, I've actually got. I'm great. I've got a roof over my head. I've got food in my belly, clothes on my back, love in my heart, peace in my soul. What more can I ask for? I'm so eternally grateful. And yes, I've made mistakes. I've the lesson, the lesson. And it, you know, I'm up with it. If other people aren't, that's not my problem. You deal with your issues and I'll deal with mine. And I'm on this amazing journey and I want to continue and I want to keep sharing. I want to bring people on the journey. I want to give other people hope. I want to go do motivational speaking. I want to go to jails. I'll probably know half the people in there. You know, I want that. That's what I want to do. I, I want to share this story and give people hope. If kebab eating crazy, Kerry Katona can get through it. Anybody can. Mm. Wow, we'll leave it on that note, but Kerry, you are a prime example of turning your adversity into an asset. So 
Thank you very much for being so candid and open with us today. And I think everyone's going to love you. Thank you for it. having me. And I love you for you. Oh, I love yours. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> looking forward to that OnlyFans collab we do one day. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care, Kerry. Thanks, Lewis.